Infant baptism. Hearing these words, you might be thinking, one, this could be the most boring capstone speech in pep history. <laughs> Two, this kid is about to step into some major heresy. Or three, doesn't he realize his grandpa is a Baptist preacher? <laughs> it would be helpful to start with what infant baptism is not. The Reformed view of infant baptism is not leftover theology of Roman Catholicism. It is not a waterless baby dedication. It is not empty sentimentality, and it is not a guarantee of the baby's salvation. So what is infant baptism? Infant baptism is a sign and a seal, a picture and a promise of God's love and care. Ligon Duncan, a Presbyterian scholar and pastor, gives a simple summary of infant baptism. He explains, in the Old Testament, God gave promises to believers and their children and gave a sign of those promises to be given to believers and their children. In the New Testament, he reiterated those same pr promises to believers and their children. Therefore, the sign of these promises should be given to believers and their children. Because these signs and promises are tied to God's covenants, in order to argue for the legitimacy of infant baptism, we must first understand the foundational doctrine of covenants. You will find no verse in the Bible that says, go therefore and baptize your babies. Otherwise, faithful Christians would not be debating this issue at all. Now, as a 17-year-old, I may not wow you with my exegetical prowess, but I hope in this speech to provide you with what I believe the Bible teaches on the subject of baptism. Therefore, in light of the Old and New Testaments, the scriptures reveal that God not only expects, but commands his followers to present their children to receive the sign of baptism in the New Covenant. In this speech, I'll first explain key hermeneutical principles and theological doctrines that weigh heavily on this issue. Then, I'll provide the necessary background information and context on covenant theology, starting with the foundational Abrahamic covenant and its culmination in the New Covenant. Finally, as we move into the body of my arguments, I will unpack a biblical case for infant baptism. Let's begin. Ultimate authority exists solely in God's word, making the interpretation of scripture vital for grasping doctrine and faithful living. Therefore, Christians desperately need the proper tools to aid in their understanding of scripture, allowing for better comprehension while avoiding misinterpretation. In his book, Knowing Scripture, R.C. Sproul defines hermeneutics as the science of interpretation. The purpose of hermeneutics is, is to establish rules and guidelines for interpretation. Like a compass pointing the way, Hermeneutics directs Christians in reading God's word and interpreting it correctly. In addition, Christians must remember a significant rule that acts like a roadmap guiding them along. This primary rule of hermeneutics is the analogy of faith, which allows us to set necessary parameters. Once again, Sproul explains this rule beautifully, writing, The analogy of faith is the rule that scripture is to interpret scripture. This means, quite simply, that no part of scripture can be used in such a way as to render it in conflict with what is clearly taught elsewhere in scripture. To put it simply, scripture will never contradict scripture, and the more clear passages help us understand the more difficult ones. Now, with proper interpretation as our goal, nothing brings us more clarity to our relationship with God than an understanding of the covenants. In the same way a skeleton structures a person's body, the covenants act as the structure of scripture. They are the theme that links the different books of the Bible together, blazing through the Old Testament like a firework before exploding in a full color in the coming of Christ. Covenants reveal and connect God's redemptive story from the very beginning to end, providing a framework for the Bible. We must have a solid understanding of the building blocks of covenants and the different signs and elements that make up these covenants. Now, since this can be complex, a variety of definitions will provide greater clarity. Let's start with a basic definition. A covenant is a conditional promise. Although a very simple definition, this is a great start to understanding what makes up a covenant. We also see this definition used when we look at the covenant of redemption, which happens within the mind of the Trinity. However, when we see God dealing with humans, we use a fuller and more detailed definition to describe a covenant. For example, a covenant is an agreement between God and human beings where God promises blessings if the conditions are kept and threatens curses if the conditions are broken. This nuanced definition should be used whenever one looks at the covenant of grace because it points to Christ who is the only one to keep all the conditions of the covenant. Ultimately, a proper view of covenants is key to understanding God, salvation, and the Bible. Now in Reformed theology, 
it is important to see that all the covenants are organically linked. There is one covenant of grace with multiple administrations, but the substance still remains the same for all. This substance is that God will rescue his people and will send them a savior. We find evidence for this in Genesis 3 when God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her offspring and your offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. We see the promise of God's champion from the very beginning, and this continues to be filled out through various administrations like the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and ultimately the new covenant. Additionally, to strengthen his people's faith, God provides covenant signs, physical signs given to his people to help them remember his promises. For example, Noah receives the rainbow, Abraham receives circumcision, and Moses receives the Passover along with the Ark of the Covenant. Because Christ died on the cross and paid the blood price for us, the bloody signs of the Old Covenant are replaced with the blood of the signs in the New Covenant. Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. Now we have no more need for bloody signs. It is key to understand that although there are multiple administrations and covenant signs, the substance of the covenant of grace remains that God is sending a champion. Now, as we unpack the covenant of grace, which is vital to our understanding in covenant baptism, we must start with its most foundational administration, the Abrahamic covenant, as explained in Genesis 12, 15, and 17. In this covenant, God makes a promise to Abraham, a covenant of salvation with him, blessing him and future generations through the coming Messiah. We have evidence of this in Genesis 17, 7, which reads, And I will establish my covenant between me, you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Here, God lays down the foundations for the covenant of grace, and we read that the sign of the covenant is given to Abraham, his children, and those in his household. Noticeably, the sign for this covenant, circumcision, was given to Abraham and his family, beginning with infant boys and then to the servants in his household. Those who hold to infant baptism believes this provides the foundation for the continuity between the old covenant promises and signs and the new covenant promises and signs. Let's review Ligon Duncan's quote. In the Old Testament, God made promises to believers and their children and gave a sign of those promises to be given to believers and their children. In the New Testament, he reiterated those same promises to believers and their children. Therefore, the sign of these promises should be given to believers and their children. This highlights one of the most important aspects on the covenant of grace, different administrations with the same essence. In summary, we look to the Abrahamic covenant to set the pattern and practice for the new covenant sign of baptism. Now, in order to grasp the concept of infant baptism, Christians need to understand the unity and continuation of the covenants, while also recognizing that the new covenant embodies all the other covenants in fulfilled form. The new covenant does not start from scratch, nor do any of the other covenants before it. The Bible is one continuous story, and Christians need to continue viewing it in this way. By examining scripture, one can see the many examples that review uh, reveal the unity of the covenants. The Emmanuel principle is one of them. It appears multiple times throughout the Bible and sums up the relationship of the covenants. We again find this example in Genesis 17 when God says, And I will establish my covenant between me, you, and your offspring after you, throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. This verse shows the eternal connection and relationship that God makes with Abraham. We need to remember that all the other covenants expand on the covenant of grace because the Bible is one continuous story. Therefore, Christians must assume continuity unless otherwise stated by Jesus in the New Testament. Now, although the covenants build on each other like blocks to create the finished product, the Mosaic covenant, while still gracious, falls away. We have evidence for this in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 32, which explains, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. This verse is distinguishing the old covenant and the new covenant, revealing how the Mosaic covenant falls away.
It is crucial that Christians see the continuation and unification of the covenants. Christians also must keep in mind that the bloody sign, circumcision, has given way to the bloodless sign, baptism, through the fulfillment of Christ on the cross. While circumcision pointed to Christ's cross, baptism revealed that Christ's perfect blood had already been shed. The promised champion delivered salvation. Look at what Paul says in Colossians. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised through him in the powerful working of God from the dead, who raised him from the dead. Paul not only emphasizes the unity of the covenants, but he also reveals how the outward nature of this sign has changed because of Christ's cross. Additionally, although circumcision was replaced, the substance, or what it represents, still remains the same. Christians must consider that the main underlying factor is union with Christ. As a result, all believers share in the covenant that God prepared for Israel through Abraham. The promise continues to be extended through parents and to their ch children, with the ordinary condition remaining that these children must ultimately express their own faith in Christ in order to reap the full benefits of the covenant. Now the new covenant provides better promises that allow for more grace along with more people to receive this sign, like the Gentiles and women. Ultimately, it is key to see that baptism replaces circumcision, and although the administration of the covenant of grace has changed, the substance still remains the same. Now one of the main questions we get from our Baptist friends revolves around whether or not children are part of the covenant community. However, by looking at New Testament examples, we can see that children are absolutely included in the new covenant. All Christians recognize that children were part of the covenant community when the covenant first began with Abraham. Jason Alopoulos, author of Covenantal Baptism, explains that the Baptistic view can offer no evidence for those exclusivist position. No example exists in the New Testament of a child being born and raised in a Christian home and then postponing their baptism until they are an adult. Proof for Baptistic position does not exist. Although scripture does not give an example of infants being baptized, it also gives no verse saying infants should not be baptized. The argument from silence falls in favor of the Pado baptist because since the Abrahamic covenant, children have been included. It would be quite strange for them to stop receiving the sign and then have no record of it. Furthermore, by looking at the New Testament, we find a language that involves infants in the covenant and therefore baptism. Acts 2, 38-39, Peter, who is speaking on the day of Pentecost, writes, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. For you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and for your children and those who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Peter is not excluding children from the covenant in this passage. He is instead echoing an Old Testament promise a promise found in Genesis 17:7, which explains, and I will establish my covenant between me, you, and your offspring after you, throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Peter is referring to the covenant promise that God gave in the Old Testament that also extends to children in the New. God is not revoking the family's inclusion of infants in the covenant. From what we hear from Peter, he is emphasizing the point of inclusion. From this, we can determine that children are not excluded from the New Testament, but are equally a part of it, just like those from the Old Testament. Now, after taking some time to explore necessary background information, along with a brief look at covenant theology, I will now close with my final arguments from God's Word. Let us begin by looking at Acts 2, verses 38 through 39, which reads, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and for your children and those who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Spoken by Peter on the day of Pentecost, this verse is a response to a question from a crowd of Jewish people crying out, What shall we do? while listening to the Apostle's sermon. Peter has made them realize that they were complicit in the killing of the Messiah, and this troop deeply convicts them. 
This is why Peter not only calls his audience to repent, but also to receive the sign of baptism. However, this is not the only thing we can pull from this passage. In verse 39, we see an echo of a promise made in the Old Testament. So in order to further explain the purpose of this promise, we must go back to when God instituted his covenant with Abraham. Genesis 12, 15, and 17 are where these foundational texts are located, and I will present them to you in this order. So bear with me. Starting in chapter 12, we are, we are introduced to this promise. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. First, we have the promise. Now to the next verse where God restates it in chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Finally, in chapter 17, God provides Abraham with a covenant sign of circumcision. As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. With these verses in the back of our minds, let us look back to the reason why Peter is bringing up this promise in the first place. What promise is he referring to? This is not the first time we actually see mention of a promise. When Luke quotes Jesus speaking after his resurrection, it says, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. We find similar language in Acts and the continuous theme of waiting for the promise of the Father. But when we jump in Acts 2.4, we see that the promise given to Abraham is the promise of the Holy Spirit who is poured out on his disciples. So when Peter speaks of a promise, we can associate this with the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, by looking at the context of these verses, we must ask a follow-up question. What is the Holy Spirit a promise of? Well, we can see that the promise made to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12 is the promise of the Holy Spirit. Look at Galatians 3, 13-14, where Paul writes, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. This is why the analogy of Scripture is so important as an interpretation principle. The New Testament helps us interpret the Old Testament. This is why Peter explains that this promise is for you and for your children and those who are far off. This mirrors what is said in Genesis 17 concerning the sign of circumcision. But look at this important thing. This is not just a Jewish ethnic thing. It is for all people. This is why Peter said this promise is for you and for your children. A sign was given in the Old Covenant to believers and their children. Now we see in Acts, a sign is given to believers and their children in the New Covenant. This is why we baptize infants. Baptism is a sign of the promise given to Abraham, of the indwelling of the Spirit. On the morning of Pentecost, we see children were included. It would be strange for them to be taken out that evening without any mention or command from God. The biggest controversy in the New Testament is to what extent the Gentiles have to follow the Jewish ceremonial laws. Paul was constantly teaching about this topic. Where was the controversy about children not being included in the covenant community? Children receive the promise, but not the sign of the new covenant? Now, is there anything in the New Testament that ties the old covenant sign of circumcision with the New Testament sign of baptism? For my last point, I will revisit circumcision and how it is replaced by baptism. In order to do this, we must look at the final piece of the puzzle, Colossians 12, 11 through 12, which reads, in him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised through him in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Notice the two main sections in this verse. In him you have been circumcised and having been buried with him in baptism. These phrases are tied together because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Now, sometimes our Baptist friends will say this is not talking about physical circumcision, but spiritual circumcision. However, we must look at the context. The debate in Colossae is not over spiritual circumcision, but physical 
Paul needs to explain this because people are telling the Colossians that they must be physically circumcised. Paul corrects them, however, saying that since you have been baptized, you have been circumcised. You have received all that the circumcision represents. Spiritual circumcision is an Old Testament idea, not a New Testament one. Moses explains in Deuteronomy 10 to circumcise your hearts, not just your foreskins. Covenant signs are meant to be an outward picture of an inward reality, like how a ring is the promise of the covenant of marriage. The sign of baptism is not strictly a timing thing for children of believing parents. We baptize not presuming on God, but because he calls us to. We do so in hope that this picture of baptism becomes a reality when our children are united with Christ. In closing, as Christians, we have a duty to study God's word and find out, what, why, uh, find out what we believe and why we believe it. While my arguments may have not convinced you, I encourage you to go home and study infant baptism for yourself. Find out where you land on this important issue, for this is no small thing that we should take for granted. When I interviewed a deacon from our church, he told me it was over the course of five or six years where he just wrestled with the idea of infant baptism. Understanding baptism is a worthy endeavor and worthy of our time and attention. So although my time is now at an end, I will end by quoting Pastor Ligon Duncan, who beautifully summarizes one of the most important points of infant baptism. He says, Baptism isn't fundamentally a picture of our commitment to God. It is fundamentally a picture of God's commitment to us. And this is why infant baptism is so beautiful, because you realize that child up there can't do anything towards God. But before that child could ever reach out to God in faith, God has already reached out to that child and placed that child in a believing home and made promises to that child. Infant baptism is a picture of God reaching out to us, revealing how the child can do nothing. God gave promises to Abraham along with a sign. And in the New Testament, God gives us a sign. Therefore, Believers, along with their children, should receive the sign of baptism. Thank you.